Thank you for taking time out of your schedule for this. So as you mentioned, uh, my book covers sex, drugs, and music, and uh, it's, I spent three years on this book. It covers an enormous range of topics. Um, and a radio interviewer asked me, tell me about the sexy, druggy research you did when you were working on this. And I was like, dude, I've never done less drugs or had less sex. I stayed home every night until two in the morning reading scientific papers. Um, so it covers a lot of stuff. Um, I'm only gonna touch on a few things in this lecture, but I can probably sum up all of it in a quip that comes from my mother. Uh, I grew up in the music industry, and my mother, who also produced this fantastic image of me at six months old, some people put their children in teddy bear costumes, other people do this. My mom is a brilliant woman, and she summed up three years of academic research with one simple point. Most fun things in life are bad for you, but nothing will kill you faster than having no fun at all. This book is not just about the science of having fun, it's about why these things are important components of the human condition. These are not trivial pursuits. And the more I researched these topics, the more I was forced to question, what does it mean to be human? What do sex, drugs, and rock and roll teach us about what it means to be human? Usually when we think about what it is that demarcates our species from other animals, we think about our so-called higher cognitive capacities, the capacity to do mathematics, the ability to remember things, the capacity to think about the past, present, and future. And we can tell a lot about that from our name, Homo sapiens, the Latin for wise man. We think that we're the thinky monkey. But if you think about scenes like this, Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock, right? I can't find any photograph that sums it up better. We've got Jimmy, sex on legs. We've got him on drugs. You know, he used to put little slits in his forehead so he could put tabs of acid there so he could be high the entire time along with his audience. And we've got 400,000 kids, okay? 400,000 people sat in a field in upstate New York for this gig. We think Glastonbury is hardcore, 150,000? They were there for one stage and they didn't have boutique camping, they didn't have cell phone chargers, there was nothing but music and drugs and probably a lot of sex. So as I'm going through this, I want you to think about what has science taught us about our supposedly base or primitive pursuits, right? But what have they done for science? What do these teach us about science? Okay, so let's dive straight in with sex. Who here knows the name Vesalius? Amazing, I'm amazed how many people don't know his name. He's known as the father of anatomy. He was a Dutch anatomist in the Renaissance era. And he invented this. He invented the art of tracing the human form in a scientific manner and turning it into these incredible creations. He could elucidate the valves of the heart. He could trace the circulatory system. And he couldn't find the clitoris. He did not believe that it existed. The father of anatomy could not find the clitoris. When a rival of his, an Italian named Rialdo Colombo, claimed to have discovered it. He believed he was the very first man to ever find it. He wrote a letter and he described it as, so pretty and useful a thing. So pretty and useful a thing. And Vesalius shot back in the letter to Fallopio, Gabriel Fallopio, who also claimed to have discovered it. Vesalius shot back with this. You can hardly ascribe this new and useless part as if it were an organ to healthy women. Keywords, new and useless. However, modern studies have shown that there are 8,000 nerve endings in the clitoris, a higher density than you can find anywhere outside the human body. And it is the only part of the human body and any animal, as far as we know, that is made for only one thing, and that is pleasure. Moreover, recent studies have found that in fact, it's a wishbone shaped structure. It doesn't just a visible nub, on the exterior of the body, it goes down around the mouth of the vulva. And it appears to increase in size and density as you age and the more you use it. And whenever I give lectures to the silver-haired set, which I often do at literary festivals, old women, 50 or over, 70 or over, 80 or over, look at me and go, yep. <laughs> now let's get to your friend and mine, the famous charmer, Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud did believe in the existence of the clitoris, but he thought it was childish. He thought women would only use it to climax if they were immature and they required masturbation or some kind of manual stimulation. He believed that if you were married to a man and engaged in penetrative sex, this would fulfill your biological imperative and you would develop into a fully formed woman who would come from penetration alone. And he called this the clitoral vaginal transfer. Sigmund Freud, always the charmer. 
I'm going to skip over this next story, but if I have time, I'll come back to it at the end because it's a bit grim, but it's pretty spectacular. Now, Masters and Johnson, most of you probably have heard of them because of that TV show, blah, blah, blah. They were very famous sex scientists, and they did legitimize the study of sex in the lab, which is important. Okay, they put people into a lab and observe them having sex. That is important, however, I consider them to be reprehensible shysters for a number of reasons. I'll get to a couple more. But they said that women who don't come from penetration alone suffered from sexual dysfunction, and they used the word diseased. The great game changer in the history of the clitoris is this woman, Sherry Height. Sherry Height was a rebel, and she was a babe, and she was a smart babe, and she was a student at Columbia. And she, like a lot of American students, because the tuition is extortionate, could not pay her tuition. So if I could do it, I would do it. She decided to pose for Playboy to make a quick buck just so she could go to school. And she didn't know what the ad, what the picture was going to appear like when it was in print. And what it was was a photograph of her in front of a typewriter. And it said, the typewriter is smart, so she doesn't have to be. Ooh, so what did she do? She staged a protest in front of Playboy headquarters demanding that the very ad she had appeared in be removed. How cool can you get? She then went on to become a verifiable scientist in her own right, and she conducted something called the Height Report, 1976. She interviewed over 100,000 women between the ages of 14 and 78, and she concluded 70%, the vast majority of women, required direct clitoral stimulation in order to orgasm. It is indeed pretty and useful. Now, other people have criticized her statistical methods, but study after study after study has upheld this figure. Now, when she put this out, she received a barrage of criticism. Playboy called it the hate report, and she could do no right. So what did she do? She moved to Berlin, and she's been there ever since. Now, let's get on to the lads. The penis. Did you know that almost every mammal has a bone in the penis? The boner is, in fact, boneless in humans, though. Weirdly, we don't have a penis, even though chimpanzees do, do dogs and cats do. This is the penis bone of a walrus. It's called an usik, and it's used as a weapon of warfare by the Inuit. <laughs> so what does it mean if all other primates have a penis bone, but we don't? That means that other factors are required to insert it and keep it up which other animals don't need. They can just use the bone for quickie mating. So what is it that you need to get it up and keep it up? What's inside your ears? If you look at the penis inside the brain, it's quite interesting. So modern studies have looked at what's called a somatosensory cortex. So everyone in this room has a strip of tissue on either side of your head. And it's a map of feeling. And it's got different sizes of portion to how many nerve endings you have in each part of your body. So for example, you have a lot of room a portion to your hands, a lot of room, a portion to your feet. Um, if we look at where those bits are, you can see, for example, the face is quite huge because it's very sensitive. Weirdly, the penis is not next to the torso, it's next to the feet. And some people think that this explains the foot fetish. That's just a theory. But what's also true is that when they finally mapped the same structures in women 50 years later, by the way, this was in the 50s, they didn't map women until the early 2000s, they found that the genitals are next to the nipples, and they think this is why some women can come from nipple stimulation alone. Just a theory. Now, when you turn this into a 3D model, it looks like this, which is very sexy indeed. <laughs> but of course, when the scientists mapped this and produced this image, Wilder Penfield, a Canadian, in the 1950s, they omitted one fact. What did they omit? The true size of the male member, if you accurately represent how big it should be, it would look like this. Now, what happens when you put them together? This is the most famous illustration probably ever created of human sex, the copulation by da Vinci. <clears throat> I expose to men the origin of their first and perhaps second reason for existing. Interestingly, he has the female, just a spurious little scribbling right there. Uh, the breasts connect to the uterus, reflecting the ancient idea that menstrual blood derives from <laughs> breast milk. And the uh, penis, the semen ducts, are connected directly to the brain, reflecting the ancient idea that semen derives from brain tissue. Make of that what you will. Now, that idea held sway for a long time, though, that when people have sex, the penis drives into a woman, 
like a sword into a sheath. Most of us would assume that that's what it feels like, right? So this is an image that was made in the 1930s by a Dutch anatomist using a glass dildo and some x-rays. Now, they updated this in 1999. Another Dutch anatomist got two people to have sex inside of an MRI scanner. Has anyone here had an MRI, right? Unbelievably claustrophobic. Can you imagine getting into one and having sex with somebody else in there? How could you possibly do this? Well, one of his research assistants, who was a scientist, had previously been a street acrobat, and so had her, and so had her boyfriend. And so they were both very thin, very flexible, and not prone to stage fright. This was pre-Viagra. So they got in, and they did the act of love in the name of science. And so what you can see is that the penis does not dive into a woman like a sword into a sheath. It bends at a 90 degree angle like a boomerang. And they didn't know this until 1999. But they didn't publish this when they first made it because they thought it was too saucy. They didn't publish it until eight years later. You've probably seen this because when New Scientist put up the video, it got millions of hits. And it's still the most viewed thing on the website. So let's go back to Masses and Johnson, who I said were jerks. No discussion of sex would be complete without a mention of homosexuality. And this is the biggest reason I think that they are jerks. They made a lot of money practicing something called conversion therapy, charging gay men money to cure them of their disease. Reprehensible. You most know that homosexuality was designated as a pathology, as an illness, until 1973 because it was put into the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual as a form of mental illness. This isn't just an academic idea. If something is in the DSM, it means that your doctor can diagnose you and treat you accordingly. And a lot of people said, well, we don't think homosexuality is a form of mental illness. But as long as it remained in that book, it technically was, until this guy came along, Dr. E. Fryer. I'm amazed how many people don't know his name. I didn't know his name until I researched for this book. I've spoken to experts on homosexual culture in this day and age who've never heard of him. Dr. E. Fryer was a psychiatrist and he was gay. And he didn't think he was crazy. And he had gay patients who he didn't think were crazy. But he couldn't come out of the closet because not only would it ruin his personal life, it would ruin his professional life. So he gave a passionate speech at the American Psychiatric Association's annual general meeting in 1972 under the name Dr. H. Anonymous, wearing a rubber w mask, a fluffy wig, and a bow tie. Now, he said, I am gay, I'm a shrink, I don't think I've suffered from mental illness, etc. It's a wonderful piece of writing. Look it up, you can read it, it's great. Now, I wouldn't think that wearing that getup would convince people that you're sane, <laughs> but it worked. It worked, and a year later, they removed homosexuality from the DSM. Imagine how much courage it took to sit on that stage in that getup and say everything he said, knowing that at any moment someone could take off his mask and ruin his life. To conclusion, scientists are people, people are flawed, and sometimes smart people think stupid things. We often think that scientists are merely people who gather data and present us with their best approximation of the truth. That's not true. <coughs> scientists are people, and they bring their prejudices and their passions to the table. And sometimes it takes bravery and rebellion to overturn entrenched stupidity. Now, let's talk about drugs. Normally when I talk about drugs, I'm at music festivals. And so people will all say, oh, what kind of drugs do you like? People go, TCB, ketamine, no, 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 no. Um, we're at Google, so I'm assuming I can't do that with you guys, because cameras everywhere will document it and send it to Theresa May. <laughs> but <laughs> I saw her story. I was at, uh, in Scotland giving a talk, this, the same talk. And most of the people were much older. It was a literary festival. They were quite buttoned up. And so I wanted to do a temperature check on the audience. I was like, OK, so do you guys like any drugs? Like, who likes drugs? People went, woo. And this old man in the front row wearing a tweed suit narrowed his eyes at me. And he said, acid. <laughs> it's like, all right, I'm preaching the converted. Let's go. I'm sure you all can imagine what science has done for drugs, right? New chemistries, blah, blah, blah. What I find way more interesting is how science has been influenced by drugs, starting with Nobel Prizes. Right. Crick and Watson, it is reputed that they got many of their insights due to experimentation with LSD. Now, this is widely reported. We did know that they were party animals. We're never really going to know the truth because they're most, uh, Crick is dead. However, we do know that this jerk, Kerry Mullis, who got the Nobel Prize in 1992, achieved his insight from LSD. 
Uh, how many people here have a biology background? Mostly your engineers. OK, who here has heard of the polymerase chain reaction? OK, so this got the Nobel Prize. I, can't, I do not have time to explain how it works, but it truly was a stroke of genius. Before he came up with this in the 1980s, it took geneticists years to unravel the language of DNA. With this simple insight, just take it, shatter it into a 1,000 shards, read them separately, and put them back together, he really did earn the Nobel Prize. And he got this insight on LSD, and I'm not making this up because it's in his autobiography, Dancing in the Mindfield. <clears throat> DNA chains coiled and floated, lurid blue and pink images of electric molecules injected themselves somewhere between the mountain road and my eyes. What are the two most important words in this quote? Mountain road, he was on acid and he was driving, and his <laughs> wife was asleep in the seat next to him. So here we have Carrie Mullis with, sorry, <laughs> Carrie Mullis, my good, Ken Kesey with the merry pranksters, you know, electrocolate acid test, blah, 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 taking acid and speed, driving around, taking more acid and speed and driving around. A Nobel Prize winning geneticist did the exact same thing. However, as I said, he's a jerk because since then he has gone on to deny the science of climate change and AIDS. As I said, smart people still think stupid things. Now let's get to a smart person who was not a jerk, one of this country's greatest scientists, Humphrey Davy, founder of the Royal Society. Now, who here has ever had a minor in their ancestry? I'm sure many of you probably do without even knowing it. If you do, you're probably alive because of this man, because he came up with this thing, the Davy gas lamp. Before he invented this, this very simple mechanism for burning methane gas at a controlled rate. Miners were dying by the thousands from uncontrolled explosions and tunnel collapse. This very simple device allowed for a small flame to burn the methane at a slow, controlled rate. Now, before he came up with this, he was enamored with a drug. What drug was that? Nitrous oxide. <laughs> uh, laughing gas, everyone's friend. It's called laughing gas. It's also called hippie crack. It is, in some ways, a very silly drug to do. You get high for 30 seconds and your head hurts. But it is scientifically and medically very important. This is the very first drug that was made in a lab that was put into the human brain. Prior to this, it was all booze, mushrooms, plants, things that grew. This is the first time something was made in a laboratory that was put into the head. It also was the very first methodical investigation of a drug. This is the first time a scientist sat down and took it constantly and gave it to other people constantly and recorded the dosage and the effects. And lastly, and but not leastly, this led to the gift of anesthesia, pain-free <laughs> surgery. Who here has had any kind of pain-free surgery? Pretty much everybody. And we probably wouldn't have it if it wasn't for this wonderful invention. Now, Humphrey Davy was tasked with exploring the virtues and the uh, qualities of various gases at a facility in Bath. And he tried a whole bunch of different gases. And one thing that he did that I love is that he tried everything on himself first. He wouldn't give it to an animal. He wouldn't give it to other people. He would try it on himself first. He was trying to explore medical potentials. At one point, he almost died from carbon monoxide poisoning. He didn't know what it would do. And then he tried nitrous, and he decided upon it for his devoted study. And devoted he was. He came up with things like this, silken bags inside of wire cages. He even built a box that he could get inside and have his assistants pump it full of the gas. At one point, he consumed 80 quarts. Teach any hippie kid today how to do a drug properly. And of course, like hippies today, he would write down what he thought were salient thoughts. I existed in a world of newly connected and newly modified thoughts. Nothing exists but thoughts. And like drug enthusiasts today, he shared it with the cool cats. <clears throat> Robert Southey, po Poet Laureate. I am sure the air in heaven must be this wonder-working gas of delight. <laughs> Samuel Taylor Coleridge, an unmingled pleasure. Anonymous, I felt like the sound of a harp. And this man said in fewer words what others would use thousands to say. I felt that I knew everything. Now, nitrous, like every other drug, did not stay in the lab. You can't keep something fun secret forever. It escaped. Here's another drug that escaped from the lab around the same time, about 100 years later, cocaine. We have your friend and mine. Before he told you that you want to have sex with your mother, and he said that the clitoris was irrelevant, this man was obsessed with cocaine. After a German chemist isolated the active component, 
It sat on a lab shelf for about 20 years until a few people started playing with it. Freud. Freud became obsessed with it, and he stayed up all night for weeks. And he wrote a very long diatribe called Uber Coca, Wonder Coke, saying basically, cocaine's really amazing. Everybody should do cocaine. It's really good for your creativity. I think everybody should do a lot of it. We'd have some really great insights, etc. <laughs> It was, like a lot of drug manuals, it was very boring. But what it did do is it led to the popularization of this drug. And most people think of the Victorians as being uptight. Nope, the Victorians loved drugs. They loved opiates, and they fell in love with cocaine. They put it in everything, and it was sold at Harrods. They put it into lozenges, syrups, candy for children, because children need help becoming hyperactive. <laughs> they put it into a wine called Ve Mariani, 8% Coke, 10% booze, blessed by a pope, and beloved, <laughs> beloved by Queen Victoria. Now, the Victorian indulgence in drugs is scientifically very relevant. Okay, it's not just funny, it's relevant because this led to the discovery, directly led to the discovery of neurotransmitters. And this is not just my opinion, this is based on a wonderful book you can read uh, called Drugged by Richard Miller, who is a neuroscientist and a chemist in Chicago. The reason drugs led to the discovery of neurotransmitters, things like dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, these things are mimicked by drugs. Drugs mimic serotonin, they mimic uh, no, dopamine. So for example, here we have psilocybin on the left, which comes from magic mushrooms. There we have serotonin on the right. Psilocybin mimics it, and what it does is it goes into your brain cells and it invades the receptors that are built for your body's natural chemicals. This is how most drugs work. So scientists and you know, the average philosopher who was experimenting with drugs at the time thought, well, how can something that comes from a mushroom or how can something that comes from a tobacco plant or how can something that comes from coffee change the way I feel? If you think about it, it is a scientific puzzle, right? And so it was drug indulgence that led to this. And so what happened was this. The typical route of investigation went like this. Scientists would map the drug and then they would find the neurotransmitter that it mimics. So the first time this happened, it was because of nicotine, the same drug that has killed untold millions of people from tobacco. This led to the very first discovery of a neurotransmitter. So nicotine was mapped in 1843. It wasn't until the 1970s that scientists tracked down the receptor in the brain that it fits into, which, is, well, which normally binds to something called acetylcholine. They named the receptor, the keyhole, they named it the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. We named our body part after a drug. And this is not the first time this happened. Cannabis, 1964, it was mapped. The endocannabinoids, your body's own natural painkillers, were mapped in 1990 and named after cannabis. Morphine, 1805, it was mapped. The endorphins were not tracked down until 1975, and again named after the drug. This even goes for molecular energy. Caffeine, which won the Nobel Prize, mapped in 1881, and I personally think caffeine deserves a Nobel Prize. ATP, what it mimics, the molecular currency of energy, was not mapped until 1929. And this is my favorite example, LSD and serotonin. It was not until experimentation with LSD around this time that people started to think that serotonin may have a role in the mind. 80% of the serotonin in your body is found in your gut, not your brain. So people didn't think it had a role in the head until a couple of different teams, one in Glasgow, one in Baltimore, did some chemical detective work, at one point carting 10,000 buckets of cow blood from an abattoir to a lab in Baltimore to prove that serotonin has a role in the brain. And we can thank this man. Albert Hoffman, this is the man who made LSD. Did you know the man who made LSD, a Swiss nerd, lived to be 102? And he took acid till he was 96. This is him on his 100th birthday. And I know people who were there, and they say that he indeed twinkled like a star and flirted with all the girls. <laughs> Now, he was not a hippie. He was a nerd. He was a bigger nerd than anyone in this room. He was the bigger, biggest nerd that ever nerded a nerd. He worked for Sandoz Chemicals in Switzerland. He worked for Sandoz his entire career. He was a company man and a total square. And he did not in experiment with drugs at all. 
he, until he made LSD. He made it by accident. He had spent 10 years crushing up the shells of chitin, of crustaceans, exploring other potential applications of other chemicals until he accidentally made LSD, got some on his fingers, and rode a bicycle home in 1943 in Switzerland and experienced the world's first acid trip. It's very famous. It's known as Bicycle Day, and you can get tabs of acid with its picture on it. Now, what was he actually trying to do when he accidentally made LSD? Does anyone know? Any guesses? It'll surprise you. He actually was trying to come up with treatments to save the lives of pregnant women. That was what he spent most of his career doing, drugs for obstetrics, and he did succeed. He made something called methergine, which is still one of the most widely used drugs in obstetrics, to prevent the death of women from postpartum hemorrhaging. The reason he came across LSD is because he was experimenting with this. This is called the ergot fungus. This is a filthy black fungus that infests fields of rye. It's a parasite, and it's a very toxic, toxic fungus, and it produces something called St. Anthony's fire. Gangrene, hallucinations. You can actually have limbs drop off <coughs> from gangrene from St. Anthony's fire if you eat rye that has been infected with this fungus. The largest outbreak in Europe, and this happened frequently throughout the medieval era, killed 10,000 people in Aquitaine in 926. The most recent outbreak of ergot fungus was in 1926 in Russia. And it's called St. Anthony's fire. It has its own saint. And this is a medieval woodcut. You can see there's hands and feet strung up from the ceiling. That's because sometimes peasants would have multiple limbs, even all four, drop off from eating this fungus. But it has other qualities. It has what are called uterotonic qualities. It can have actions on the uterus. So midwives knew that if they used small amounts of it, they could have useful properties in childbirth. So what Hoffman wanted to do was to find synthetic analogs of this that wouldn't have the toxic properties that could kill you, but would still be useful on the uterus. So if you remember anything about LSD, please remember it comes from a saint. Sorry, it comes from a parasite. <laughs> it has its own saint. And it was born in the quest to save the lives of pregnant women. Now, when Hoffman tried it, he didn't think people would do it for fun. Bless his heart. Uh, he thought it would only be useful to artists and to scientists. And he believed that it could be for psychiatry what the microscope was for biology and the telescope for astronomy. Now. He sincerely hoped it would only be used by psychiatrists and scientists. Unfortunately, as I said, you can't keep something fun secret forever. Once it got to the hands of the hippies, especially this guy, Dr. Timothy Leary, most known for turn on, tune in, drop out, it was, became highly popular. <clears throat> to give you an idea of just how popular it was and how much this scared the authorities, Nixon called him the most dangerous man in America, which is incredible because everything he ever wrote is unbearably boring. <clears throat> This is one of my favorite photographs from the era. Did you know that the American government actually was considering dropping bombs made of acid onto enemy combatants as a means of destabilizing them? They had no idea how ironic it would be when they wrote, drop acid, not bombs. So for a while, you couldn't experiment with psychedelics on humans. You could only do it on animals. This is one of the most famous illustrations that you can see. You probably have seen this on like BuzzFeed or some crap. It's true, though. And this research was funded by NASA. Okay, NASA in the 1970s, they gave drugs to spiders to get a rough idea of how toxic they were. So here we have marijuana on the top left, which is pretty competent, but it looks like the spider just gave up halfway through. <laughs> the most messed up web is caffeine, bottom right, which is a bit disturbing. And here we have LSD, bottom left, which is basically perfect, but broad. Make of that what you will. Now, you could experiment on humans legally, and not animals, if you did what? If you made something brand new, like this guy, who you probably have heard of, he died last year, Alexander Shulgin. Alexander Shulgin was a scientist working for Dow, and he then decided to quit making pesticides and set up shop in his garden to only make illegal drugs after a student gave him some MDMA. He figured out how to re-engineer MDMA, and he gave the world the recipe. If it wasn't for this man, we probably wouldn't have rave culture. It was first created by Merck in 1912. It wasn't until he tried it and gave the world the recipe, which is still freely available online, arrowid.com. Now, what I love about Shulgin is that he made thousands of chemicals, and like Humphrey Davy beforehand, he tried everything on himself 
first. He wouldn't give it to an animal. He would do it on himself first. And the word for that is chivalry. <laughs> and then if he thought it was fun, he'd give it to his wife. And if she thought it was fun, they would share it with their friends. So he figured out how to synthesize MDMA in 1976. He created more than 2,000 chemicals in his time, of which 200 were psychoactive. So carrying on, not much happened because of this jerk, but today we're experiencing something called the psychedelic renaissance. I'll run through this very quickly, but it's very important. All drugs are double-edged swords, okay? Whether you're talking about caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, psychedelics, every drug has good and bad properties. There's no such thing as a bad drug or a good drug. It's about how you use it. Think about morphine. We've never made a painkiller more, more effective than what plants can give us. Now, these dangerous, very powerful drugs can have useful properties in the right place, at the right time, on the right person. Very briefly, they're looking at how to use LSD to treat alcoholism, psilocybin to treat obsessive compulsive disorder, MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. The list goes on and on and on. And some of this is crowdsourced. So for example, people who have uh, high levels of autism, like adults who are high functioning, found that taking MDMA on a weekend out with their friends in the late 90s at raves helped them with their social interactions. They lobbied for legitimate research into this and they won. And there are real scientific studies being conducted to look at how to use MDMA to help high functioning autistics. Moreover, people who suffer from cluster headaches, which are known to be excruciatingly painful and very hard to treat, found that taking LSD alleviated their symptoms and they lobbied for legitimate science and they won. Crowdsource science. So could psychedelics be for the mind what the telescope was for astronomy? That remains to be seen, but at least now we can find out. As David Nutt puts it, drugs are an important part of our evolutionary history and we cannot ignore them. Oh. <clears throat> now, last subject, music, which is my favorite subject, as I always say. Music has never killed any of my friends or destroyed my home. It's my favorite subject of all. And I can rip through this very quickly in the time we have left because I think it is the best subject in the whole wide world. So what is music? It's a biological puzzle. Give me, give me a guess. What do you think music is? Define it. Come on, this is a room of smart people. That's an excellent answer, the universal language. That's a good one. No one, no one said that before, actually. Most of the time, people say things like this, organized sound. OK, yeah, fine. Music is organized sound, but so is an alarm clock. That's not music. Uh, beautiful math. Music is indeed mathematical, and it is certainly beautiful. But there are many forms of mathematics that are not musical. Uh, music, above all, is an exquisite illusion. It's an illusion that your brain makes for you. It doesn't exist in the objective world around you. It is a subjective reality that your brain creates for you, inside your head and only inside your head. And the best way that I can explain this is that there is a condition called amusia. This means no music. People who have amusia tend to be perfectly intelligent in every other capacity. There's nothing wrong with their hearing. They just don't hear the same comp composition of harmonies that most other people hear. And it's very, very common. In fact, 4% of the human population appears to not hear music. There's about a dozen different forms. Some people can hear timbre, but they can't perceive rhythm. Some people can perceive rhythm, but they can't perceive timbre. If you think that you may have some inability to perceive music in the way that other people do, you can take an online test from scientists at McGill who study this. They've studied this for a very long time. And there are some famous people who seem to have had amusia, including Che Guevara. Now, in the rest of us, what's going on to create the perception of music? For people who have amusia, it tends to just sound like noise. It sounds like unstructured, just bothersome noises. But in the rest of us, our brains do something to create the perception of color and emotion and meaning. Why is that? Because it's a cliche, but it's true. The most complicated thing in the universe is inside your head. It's not even any computer in this building, no matter how great you might imagine them to be. It's not as great as what's inside your head. There are more possible connections between the neurons in your head than there are atoms in the universe. And it's an oft-repeated figure, but it's true. Now, 
Scientists used to think that music was just a byproduct of language. They just thought that language was the key thing that made the human brain special and that music was basically sonic junk food. That it just took advantage of the structures in your head that were built for grammar, patterns, repetition. Steven Pinker, a very famous neuroscientist, said in the 1980s that music was only, quote, auditory cheesecake. What benefit could there be to diverting time and energy to making plinking noises? As far as biological cause and effect are concerned, music is useless. To quote Vesalius, useless. A French scientist went even further, Dan Spielberg. He called it an evolutionary parasite. A parasite. Okay, let's look at this logically. Okay, yes, when you look in the brain and what happens when you listen to music or when you speak or read, there are some structures that are shared in common but not all of them, they overlap. And you can have amusia and still perceive language, but you can also fail to perceive language in what's called aphasia, say if you have a stroke, and you can still perceive music. The most famous example is this guy, Vasarian Shebelin was a composer who had a stroke. He lost the ability to speak, but he could still compose symphonies, not just melodies, entire symphonies. And he spoke to his wife through music for about 15 years. Now, other things in the realm of neuroscientists, neuroscience can teach us about music. When neuroscientists finally looked at the brain, and when you listen to music, they found that there isn't just one spot in the brain that responds to music. It seems to involve every single component of your brain. The new stuff at the front, the frontal cortex, ancient things at the back, the cerebellum, bits on the side, deep inside ancient structures associated with memory, with emotion, front to back, top to bottom, left to right, everything, more parts of your brain than any other human activity. And this is why it is an illusion. That's why this is this magical thing that happens inside your head, this unique perception. It even engages parts of your brain at the very back, ancient parts of your brain, including your spinal cord, which is not stimulated by a spoken language or random noises, but it is stimulated by music. Moreover, coming back to our friend's drugs, Music can produce releases of endorphins and dopamine inside your brain in the same way that marijuana, that sex, can, and cocaine and heroin can. You do not need any drugs. All you need is your iPod. It is an auditory sex toy. And Apple might want to phase it out, but I still think it's the best. And this is my favorite little tidbit from neuroscience. Music makes every neuron in your head pulse in synchrony. Nothing else does this to your brain as far as we know. Absolutely nothing. And when they discovered this, they called it a wow moment. Moreover, every single human culture makes music. Not every single human culture has the number zero. Writing, architecture, agriculture, stratified social structures. Every single human culture in the world makes music. It is so ancient. Some of the oldest artifacts that we have ever found have been musical instruments. This is a 40,000-year-old flute, and it's a flute. This was found in Slovenia. It's made from the bone of a bear. So imagine how much further back in time we were making drums or just singing. Moreover, as I'm sure most of you who have kids or have spent time with kids can attest, babies love music. There is a language called motherese that's found in every single culture in the world. When people speak to their babies in a lilting sing-song fashion, every single culture in the world does this. And we know that kids love music and that they learn things better through music, such as the ABC song. This, by the way, is a photograph of my brother at about two and a half years old. Uh, he also works for Google. He's in Toronto. If you guys use Twitter or Google Plus or anything, Ben Cormier. I love that photo. Now, who here knows the phrase retail therapy? I think it's one of the ickiest pairings in the English language. <laughs> Buy stuff you don't need to feel better. Uh, music therapy, though using music as medicine. And I'm not just talking about hippy-dippy, using music to feel better in some sort of wishy-washy fashion. I'm talking about real double-blind constructed scientific studies where they're looking at using music to help real human conditions such as Parkinson's, helping people with their tremors, helping people with memory problems, Alzheimer's. In the same way that kids learn to speak using music, we can help people who've lost language with music. We can help people regain the ability to speak and read better if it's aided with music than by language alone. So obviously it has some deep roots. How might music have evolved in the first place? Could it have an adaptive benefit? 
could it have been selected for? What's the most obvious answer? Come on, it's a gimme. Most obvious answer. Sex. Darwin thought so. I conclude that musical notes and rhythm were first acquired by the male or female progenitors of mankind for the sake of charming the opposite sex. Darwin. What is the less obvious answer? Social bonding, using music to communicate with other people. In most cultures, music is not a spectator sport. It's something that you do with other people together as a communal activity. And we have found that when people sing in choirs, when they sing together, it produces the release of a hormone called oxytocin. It's also known as the trust hormone that's involved in breastfeeding and released by orgasm. And it's released when you sing with other people. Now, if we weren't able to bond with other people, and most importantly, to keep a rhythm with other people, we couldn't have done things like this. We wouldn't be able to lift giant structures. We wouldn't be able to coordinate our efforts and build monumental architecture in the pre-industrial age if it wasn't for the fact that we can keep a beat. Obviously, you need 10,000 slaves, too. But being able to do this all at once, heave ho, heave ho. If we didn't have music, we couldn't have built the pyramids. So could we have formed large, complex societies without music? Could music predate language as a form of communication? Would we ever have evolved language without music? Would we be human without music? Last question. Do animals make music? If animal could make music, what kind of music would animal make? Animal beat drum! No one ever gets that. OK. <laughs> so some real scientists decide to investigate this question. Do marmosets? like music. Obviously birds and whales, animals that use vocal communication like have, they, they enjoy some forms of sonic composition, but the question remained, do primates, do other primates like music? So a guy named Josh McDermott, who was a club DJ, who then became a neuroscientist, decided to investigate this in a serious fashion. And he made a little multi-room rave. And he had different speakers at different ends of this little rave, playing different kinds of music, Classical, grunge, techno, jazz, anything you want. What kind of music do you think the marmosets preferred, depending on where they went in the maze? Jungle? <laughs> no. The answer is silence. The answer is silence no matter what. They always preferred silence. So he concluded that marmosets don't like music. Clearly, we're the only primate that does. Other scientists have said, well, clearly songbirds like music. Whales, blah, blah, blah. It becomes a big semantic argument. What constitutes music, blah, blah, blah. One scientist decided to draw a line in the sand, and he said, OK, lots of animals have very interesting sonic compositions, but only we can keep a beat. Only humans can do this. And when he said this, he got a flurry of angry emails. The internet unleashed its rage. No, 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 my dog loves Snoop Dogg. No, 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 my cat loves the Pussycat Dolls. No, 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 no. And he said, fine, fine, fine. If you have a pet and you think your pet can keep a beat and you live within 200 miles of the San Diego area, I will pay for your travel, you can come to my lab, and I will test it. And you've probably seen this because it has been viewed umpteen million times on YouTube. This is Snowball. But he kept a beat so accurately, this was written up in a scientific paper published in 2009 in the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, the world's first animal shown to keep a beat. <laughs> if you like this, you can see videos of Snowball rocking out to Thriller by Michael Jackson and the Backstreet Boys. And when they took the music and slowed it down and sped it up, he could still keep a beat. He wasn't just following his owner. And this was a scientific first because of the fury of the internet. Now, just because Snowball can keep a beat doesn't mean that all birds can keep a beat. He's a pet and he's been habituated to his owner's habits. But what we do know is that among primates, we are alone. We are the musical monkey. We are also the druggiest monkey. And we are certainly a randy monkey. As I said, we always think about our higher cognitive capacities as to being the key to what makes us human. And we denigrate these three activities as being basic and primitive and unimportant. But in fact, the more you look at them, the more you realize that they are spectacular components of the human condition. Yes, other animals get high and rut and make noise, but we have taken all three to the next level. And we wouldn't be human if it wasn't for them. 
And moreover, being naughty has led to some of science's most important discoveries. There is redemptive value in being rebellious. Hi hedonistic impulses have informed our highest pursuits, and there's nothing wrong with having fun. Don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions, so please raise your hands and wait for the microphone. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's awesome. Thanks. Uh, my name is Edita, and I wanted to ask what happens when we imagine physics? So you were talking about yes, yeah, yeah, that's it. When we imagine physics, and to follow that up, well, can and physics people imagine physics? Yes, that's a really good question. So they have found that when you sit inside a brain scanner. The pattern of activity inside your brain when you imagine listening to a particular song is pretty much identical to what happens as to when you actually hear that song. So you can just make the music inside your head whenever you want. It looks the same. As for amusia, um, as I said, there's a dozen different forms. And most people who have amusia, um, they just find music confusing. And they don't really understand what it is that the rest of us like. But you actually, it depends on the different kind you have. As I said, there's a dozen different kinds because there's different bits of your brain that can be malfunctioning. And there have been cases of people who have trained themselves to perceive music differently. And some people who don't perceive timbre, for example, they still enjoy rhythm. So if you have that, go to a rave. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Hi. Hi. Uh, I, was, I was wondering, given how great, obviously, sex and drugs are, <laughs> um, what do you attribute like, the social stigmas? The social stigma? Yeah. Uh, that's a very good That's Yeah, no, that, that's. Uh, um, that's the question I was forced to think about an awful lot. Um, I could quote my mother again. She said, you know, to the authorities, sometimes just the thought of somebody else somewhere having fun is just intolerable. Um, sex, I mean, there are some biological reasons why sex would have a stigma because it is dangerous and it does spread disease or it does break your heart and it is a touchy subject. It's not easy to see other people doing it all the time. I mean, I hated researching sex. I absolutely hated it. I hated reading about it constantly when I was sitting at home dead sober by myself. Um, as for drugs, again, you know, there's a realistic reason why it might have a stigma, but, uh, you know, as because it can be dangerous, but your guess is as good as mine. I mean, what do you think? I mean, that's not really a scientific question as it is a political one. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, my question is sort of connected to that one. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about, and sorry, this is a very broad question. That's okay. Can you talk a little bit about the connection between the science of drugs and the criminalization and the, the more recent decriminalization of, of some drugs? Yeah, sure. It's completely nonsensical and it's silly. The, um, I mean, the war on drugs has obviously failed. Everybody knows that it's failed. Um, and the scientific basis as for what drugs are illegal and what drugs are not illegal is not very sound. And the Psychoactive Substances Bill is ridiculous. The, I'm not sure if many of you know about this, but the bill that they're putting through where they want to make all legal highs except for tea, coffee, and alcohol, and tobacco. Those are the only like, handful of things that they're saying that you should be able to buy over the counter in any way, shape, or form. Technically, that would prohibit you from smelling a rose. Technically, it would, no, I'm not, like there have been lawyers who've written about this in, in terms of the, neuro, the neurological effects you get from other things that produce pleasure. Um, as to why they want to clamp down on these things and why, I mean, I understand why they want to do it because they don't like the idea of kids doing drugs in fields unattended. Why they think they'll be successful is beyond me. There's no way that this is going to work. Prohibition has never worked. Um. Any more questions? Uh, okay, in that case, sure. please uh, join me in thanking Zoe. Thank you.